In this video, we're going to look at thermal regulation. You should refer to the A2 AQA Biology textbook by Glenn and Susan Toole, and we're going to use pages 196 to 199. After watching this video, you should have achieved these objectives. You should appreciate the importance of thermal regulation. You should be able to describe how ectotherms regulate their body temperature. You should be also be able to describe how endotherms regulate their body temperature. And finally, you should understand the role of the hypothalamus in the thermal regulation of endotherms. So let's begin. The obvious place to start will be with this question. What is thermal regulation? It's how organisms maintain a constant body temperature and it's a form of homeostasis. It's vital to keep our enzymes happy. Remember from the last video? If the temperature is too low, our enzymes will not function at a good rate. And if the temperature is too high, they denature. So how can organisms gain heat? They produce some heat through metabolic processes like respiration. And that's pretty useful. They can also gain heat by conduction, convection or radiation. And let's define those terms a little bit. Conduction is heat transfer through solids due to vibrating particles passing on energy to adjacent particles and so on. Convection occurs in liquids and gases where warmed matter moves and passes on energy. Radiation is totally different. This is where electromagnetic waves carry the energy and then lose it to the objects that they strike. So for losing heat, we're looking at organisms being able to lose heat via the evaporation of water during sweating, and once again by conduction, convection and radiation, just like before. Now when we rattle through our objectives at the start of this video, I use some terms that you probably weren't familiar with. You'll know what they are, but you'll not heard them um, specifically mentioned with the scientific names before. I'm talking about endotherms and ectotherms. And if we look at the definition for each of these, it becomes clear what we're talking about. So ectotherms are organisms which gain most of their heat from their environment. You might have once referred to these as cold-blooded animals. Endotherms gain their heat from metabolic processes. So you might once have called these warm-blooded. So ectotherms cold-blooded, endotherms warm-blooded. Let's look at ectotherms in some detail. They exhibit quite a few behavioural adaptations that allow them to control their body temperature. They bask in the sun, they take shelter to cool off, and they press their bodies into the ground either to gain heat from hot rocks or to lose it to cool ones. Ectotherms also display a few physiological methods for controlling body temperature. They still, you know, generate some of their heat metabolically, just not that much. The colour of the skin is interesting too. Darker colours will absorb more heat than lighter colours, so you tend to find darker lizards in cooler locations. Let's move on to endotherms. These guys have a relatively constant body temperature that in most cases ranges from 35 to 44 C. And that's a compromise between having a higher temperature that would allow enzymes to function at a faster rate and the amount of food that would have to be consumed in order to maintain that higher temperature. So how do endotherms gain heat in cooler environments? The first method we're going to look at is how they constrict blood vessels near the surface of the skin. This is vasoconstriction. It maintains blood flow to the vital organs and reduces blood flow to the skin. Therefore, less heat is lost to the environment via radiation. This is done by narrowing the arteriole near the skin's surface by using a small sphincter muscle and opening a shunt vessel, which is a bit like a shortcut for the blood. Endotherms also shiver. These involuntary muscle contractions generate heat, which is useful. Hairs will also rise, which traps a layer of insulating air between the skin and the environment. Metabolic rate can also be raised. Of course, this doesn't involve eating more food, but instead it's the speeding up of reactions, such as respiration, within the body. And this produces heat as a byproduct. And of course, when we're trying to gain heat, we sweat less. Lovely.
Some organisms also exhibit behavioural adaptations. These penguins huddle together to share warmth between them. What's amazing as well is they rotate to ensure all of the members of the group have a chance to be in the middle. Penguins are awesome. Okay, that's gaining heat taken care of. Let's look at how endotherms lose heat if they're too warm. Now first up is vasodilation. This is the opposite of vasoconstriction. We're going to open up the blood vessels close to the surface so plenty of blood flows through and loads of heat can be lost by radiation this way. We can also sweat more. Brilliant. Endotherms can also lower their body hair, which makes the layer of insulating air trapped between hairs much thinner. Endotherms can also exhibit behavioural mechanisms like finding shelter. All the Google Images pictures for shelters were dull, so here's a couple of guys in brilliant sleeping bags. All of these processes are carried out without you even thinking about it. So how does it happen? It's down to a small region of your brain known as the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus coordinates an appropriate response to the changes in blood temperature. One section of the hypothalamus is known as the thermoregulatory center, and it's made up of the heat loss center and the heat gain center. The heat loss center controls mechanisms for losing heat, and the heat gain center controls mechanisms for, for gaining heat. And that's easy. Here's how it works. Let's say our blood temperature drops. This is detected by receptors in the skin. A signal is passed on to the hypothalamus, which activates the heat gain center. The heat gain center then signals the mechanisms for heat gain to activate, so we get vasoconstriction, shivering, hairs raised, and increased metabolism. We've also got another negative feedback loop, just like in the last video, to make sure things don't go too far. Let's now say our blood temperature rises. Once again, this is detected by receptors in the skin, and a signal is passed on to the hypothalamus. This time, the heat loss center is activated, and then so are the heat loss mechanisms. Hurrah! Back to normal temperature. This is also available in your textbook on page 199. Let's summarize. Thermoregulation is a form of homeostasis. Ectotherms take heat from their environment. Endotherms maintain their heat metabolically. Endotherms use a variety of heat loss mechanisms, including sweating, vasodilation, and lowering body hairs. Endotherms use a variety of heat gain mechanisms, vasoconstriction, shivering, and raised body hairs. In endotherms, the hypothalamus coordinates responses to change in body temperature. Here's some extra reading. It's from Biology Mad. It's a pretty good document. Let's have a look at it. Thanks for watching.